good eve to shift you on falchion shaw uh it's misha jim gibney tell me in a wall um failing football okay <clears throat> you're all very welcome to uh Fela and in football 2020 and th this is a very special um Fela this year uh, due to the um the virus um, we are online. And this afternoon, I am speaking with Richard Humphreys, who is a judge of the High Court of Ireland. He is also the author of two books relating to the question of Irish unity. The first is Countdown to Unity, and his most recent book is Beyond the Border. This is the second time that Richard um, has spoken at Fela and Tashe Ann Falcha. Grimaldi. Richard is, is an advocate, a leading advocate, I might say, of the importance of reconciliation and accommodation as contributing to the constitutional debate about Ireland's future. As an Irish government advisor in 1996, he attended with an Irish delegation the beginning of the multi-party talks, which led to the Good Friday Agreement two years later. And I would like now to introduce Richard, who will make a, par a PowerPoint presentation, which will last somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes. And then after that, Richard and I will discuss the implications of what he has just presented to yourselves. Richard, over to you. Gurmila Market, uh, Jim, Tom, uh Thank you very much for inviting me back um, after last year. And it's a pleasure to be able to talk this evening on the question of accommodating unionist and British identities. I might just start with one or two disclaimers given my day job, which is non-political. I'm neutral on political questions. I'm not advocating United Ireland, United Kingdom, I'm leaving all that to the politicians and civil society. Uh, but what I can do is explore options and talk about the implications and uh, possibly offer some suggestions and thoughts for discussion, not fixed answers or anything like that, but possible solutions and possible questions uh, around the question of accommodation. One thing I might just say at the outset is that um, I want to talk today about what Republicans, nationalists, and the Irish state uh, can do in terms of accommodating the Protestant, unionist, loyalist, British identity. There is obviously also the question of the other way around, but that's really a separate discussion about what the PUL uh, community can do to accommodate nationalism. And um, um, that's possibly a, a separate discussion for another day. So I want to just start with kind of the concept of shades of identity and maybe how we can kind of get away from a sort of a binary us versus them and either or Irish versus British and so on. Now, the Good Friday Agreement, as far as the six counties are concerned, enshrines the right of everybody to be British or Irish or both. But even within that, there are other options and other shades. There's obviously the uh, category of inverted commas others. Um, there are uh, people who, an increasing number, obviously, on the um, figures we have, who prefer to see themselves as uh, Northern Irish. And certainly in the past, if you think about Irish history, these boundaries were not um, maybe as fixed as they're sometimes seen today. Uh, just a couple of small examples, but there are lots of these examples. I visited recently the grave of uh, Bishop William Bedell. Uh, who lived between 1571 and 1642. He was the uh, Church of Ireland Bishop of Kilmore. And his, this, this memorial um, to him, which is in Irish and English, describes him as Optimus Anglorum, which means the best of the English. And under his patronage, the Old Testament was translated into Irish uh, for the first time. Another example you're all familiar with uh, from the cultural and across the road, Robert Chipboy McAdam. Uh, one of his biographers said uh, he was a member of that remarkable generation of Presbyterian industrialists who embraced all branches of culture and saw no contradiction between the encouragement of the Irish language and loyalty to the crown. 
And another example that just um, I noticed uh, just earlier this morning, uh, walking on the way here, in Donegal Square, just outside uh, City Hall, there's a um, statue of Lord Dufferin, Viceroy of India, Governor General of Canada, MP, Her Majesty's Lord Lieutenant for the County of Down, it says on the, on the memorial. But it also says, uh, a great Irishman. And it's very interesting to think about how, certainly before partition, um, uh, people of a, of a sh shall we say, a, a British affiliation would have naturally seen themselves as Irish men in the Irish or Northern Irish context. Um, so uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying here is, we need to perhaps get away from too, too rigid a view about what the, uh, how, to, how people can be categorized and allow people to have a multiplicity of identities and a multiplicity of options. I mean, I like to sort of talk about myself in this context in the sense, okay, I'm legally Irish and legally European, but I also see myself to some extent, not to, uh, not to an overwhelming extent, but to some extent as culturally British as well. And I think that you can be uh, you can be Irish and you can be a Republican, uh, but you can also recognize your own uh, British identity, British dimension, even if it's only 1%. Um, we speak English uh, to a large extent. I mean, you know, obviously it's nice to speak Irish as well, but we also participate in an awful lot of positive things about British culture. Um, and I think it's good to recognize that diversity and not have too rigid a definition of what a Republican is or what a Republican or a nationalist looks like. Um, the context then for talking about accommodation, I mean, obviously this is, um, this is a time of massive change. Brexit is the main um, agent of change, which has really shaken the constitution of the United Kingdom, uh, both in Scotland and in the North of Ireland. Brexit has changed the Irish question. I mean, the old joke obviously used to be that every time the English got nearer to solving the Irish question, the Irish changed the question. That was Gladstone, I think. But um, this time the British have changed the question because a border poll is now not just about Irish unity versus the United Kingdom. It's about whether Northern Ireland is in or out of the European Union. And that very fundamentally changes the question. So we've the ongoing uncertainty then about the future relationship agreements, what's that going to look like, um, the impact of the protocol to the withdrawal agreement and the inverted commas border in the Irish Sea and how that's going to pan out. There's political changes as well. I need hardly r remind the audience of the loss of the unionist majority in, in all of the various institutions, the European Parliament before Brexit, Northern Irish Assembly uh, some time back, um, Westminster, and the intensified discussion on the constitutional arrangements, um, which, which is going beyond purely nationalism and many individuals that aren't um, necessarily to be described as nationalists, that maybe are from the other category or even individual unionists are involved in that um, discussion. And the recent establishment under the programme for government of the shared island uh, unit in the Thetix department, which has yet to be teased out as to what that exactly is going to involve. So accommodation and uh, accommodation of the British identity isn't something that we have a standing start, if you like. It's something that's been happening over a fairly long period. And it's both at the level of the Irish state and at the level of nationalism, republicanism, and also culturally. And I just want to give a few highlights. This isn't meant to be kind of comprehensive, but you've going back to 1973 onwards, the special position of the Catholic Church abolished by a huge majority in a referendum in the South, the New Ireland Forum. British citizens were given voting rights in 1984. Then in the 1990s, you had the various um, LGBTQ rights, the Forum for Peace and Reconciliation, the divorce referendum, which uh, I was involved in myself and as a government advisor in the 90s. Uh, use Articles 2 and 3 of the Constitution with the aspiration not so much of uniting the territory, but of uniting all the people who share the territory of the island of Ireland in all the diversity of their identities and traditions. And that's a, that's a very striking and a very poetic and a very inclusive kind of a phrase that we're, we're now recognizing um, all of the uh, diversity, all of the identities and all of the traditions. 
Uh, then in more recent times, um, the opening of the Battle of Boyne, of the Battle of the Boyne site, the Queen's visit to Ireland, and President Higgins' uh, state visit to the UK, the Decade of Centenaries, which has been conducted in a very inclusive manner, and then just in the past few years, marriage equality, uh, the repeal of the Eighth Amendment, and the blasphemy uh, referendum abolishing the the offence of blasphemy from the Constitution. Uh, so then that's the Irish state, then republicanism and culture. So here is um, a picture of um, Martin McGuinness uh, shaking hands with Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, uh, with President Higgins and uh, First Minister Robinson and uh, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland uh, looking on and Mrs Higgins. Um, I include that then in my list of different kind of steps and gestures that republicanism and Irish culture have taken. So we've got the scrapping of Rule 21 and the GAA allowing security forces to be involved in the GAA. Uh, we have Alex Maskey laying a wreath at the Somme commemoration in 2003. The rule on foreign sports then the GAA Rule 42 being relaxed in 2005. We've Sinn Féin joining the executive with the DUP. The, we've Martin McGuinness shaking hands with Queen Elizabeth. Mart Marcino Mullor uh, taking part in the Armistice Day um, uh, um, commemoration in 2013. Um, another meeting between Martin McGuinness and the Queen in 2014. Jerry Adams meeting Prince Charles in 2015. 2018, then Mary Lou MacDonald discussing the possible question of changing the flag and the anthem and so on in the context of a United Ireland. So Fundamentally, really, what I, the point I want to get across uh, this evening is why should Republicans and Nationalists be interested in accommodating the British slash Unionist slash PUL identity? And it seems to me that there's a number of reasons why you should be interested. Uh, first of all, it builds relationships. Uh, it makes the six counties a better place to be and to live in. Uh, no matter what your views are on the constitutional uh, discussion, if uh, peoples and communities have the best possible relationships, it reduces tensions in the sense that, you know, I'm personally neutral on the question of what happens constitutionally ultimately, but I'm not neutral on any constitutional debate being conducted in a peaceful and, a, and a harmonious manner. These are huge questions, obviously. I mean, the Question, the question of the British presence in Ireland has, has haunted all of Irish history. So it's, it's a gigantic question in terms of, of Ireland and Ireland, Ireland, Irish destiny, if you like. But it's possible to get through it uh, in a way that's not painful and not tense and not conflictual um, as much as humanly possible. And the way to do that is to focus very strongly on the need for accommodation of all identities. So it underpins a peaceful future than whatever the constitutional decision is going to be. Uh, for those who are making the case for United Ireland, if you're prepared to, accom to accommodate the British identity now, that demonstrates good faith in the context of what you're promising to do. Uh, jam today is always considerably of more value than jam tomorrow. And it's very easy to say, look, of course, we'll cherish unionists. Cherish is not a great word in this kind of context. Um, you know, we'll cherish unions down the line someday. Um, that doesn't really cut any ice. Um, it's, that sort of sentiment has a lot more weight and a lot more value if you're prepared to provide some of it up front and to show that you do have good faith about accommodating other identities. And then the final angle to it is that, and you know, I'm not suggesting you should accommodate unionism and the British identity to get something back for nationalism and republicanism. Uh, it's worth doing in itself, but there is an element of getting something back, which is that it strengthens the case for the Irish identity being recognised across a number of different contexts, and also for holding the UK government to account in relation to their various commitments under the um, Good Friday Agreement and other agreements. So what would this uh, possible accommodation look like? Well, look, you know, I'm, I'm not sort of proposing any definite solutions. These are any options we can talk about. Uh, one option is the shared island unit that I mentioned, 
So one possibility would be a strand to that which dealt with reconciliation and accommodation, perhaps a forum uh, on accommodation and reconciliation to pick up where the other one left off. Um, strength, strengthening the East-West links with um, Britain and the devolved jurisdictions as well, respecting, of course, the fact that you know the UK has its own constitutional arrangements. And then representation of the PUL community in the institutions uh, within the 26 counties. Um, there are different ways of, of doing that, but um, it's, it's valuable if there is um, visible representation for uh, minorities. Uh, then on constitutional issues, now this is one really more for the, um, more for the 26 county constitutional um, uh, context, which is that there are quite a number of provisions in the constitution that uh, would be very hard to view as being inclusive or accommodating. The language of the preamble is very Catholic and very nationalist. Uh, there's quite a lot of provision on religion and the use of religious language that is quite off-putting. Um, British citizens don't have full rights to political participation, uh, such as to be members of the Iraq. Just, I mean, an example would be if a unionist who identifies as British accepts nomination to the Shannad. Now, you know, they have to be offered the nomination, but if they accepted it, um, they therefore become in law an Irish citizen, even if they don't want to be. Uh, you can't have full political participation without asserting Irish citizenship. Uh, I just mentioned the voting rights for 16 to 18 year olds simply because if, um, you know, I've heard the argument made that in the event of a border poll, there would be a view that it should have a wide franchise along the lines of the um, Scottish uh, referendum and Scottish law. But if you want to make that argument, you need to start with the law in relation to the 26 counties, because uh, likewise in relation to British voting rights. I mean, I've also heard the counter argument that uh, the UK government would be entitled to restrict the franchise to UK citizens uh, in, in a border poll because the because Irish um, constitutional law restricts the franchise in a constitutional referendum in the 26 counties to Irish citizens and British citizens don't have a vote. So th those points probably fall under my heading of, look, if you provide accommodation, you then make the case and make it easier to be accommodated yourselves. Uh, other provisions that are somewhat out of date and not inclusive or overly Catholic, shall we say, the women in the home uh, clause, which is still there despite, despite everything. And um, the fact that the president, the council of state and judges indeed have to take a religious declaration. Uh, there's no, um, no a neutral um, wording for that. It's, it's a religious, a public declaration. Okay, so that's constitutional issues. Then cultural issues. I've mentioned the fact that it doesn't have to be either or. We should acknowledge and you know, leave open the possibility of celebrating and taking pride in Ireland's existing British dimension and conversely, Britain's Irish dimension. Um, there's a lot of Irish people have gone to Britain and enjoyed it there. Um, uh, Darrow Brian said recently, I think, um, on Twitter that he was not a West Brit because he lived in Britain. Um, and he was quite enthusiastic about that. Um, nationalists don't have to embrace something new about Britishness. Uh, all they need to do is to uh, acknowledge uh, what's already here and what's already in front of you um, and see the positive in it. So I'd say in tandem with that, lo uh, loosen up the cultural certainties a bit and expand the definition of what a nationalist is or what a Republican is. Some nationalists could be perfectly okay with acknowledging and celebrating and taking pride in a dimension of Britishness along with a dimension of Irishness and a dimension of being European and a dimension of being international. Another sort of angle to this also is that we have David Trimble's comment about the northern state being a cold house for nationalists. Well, likewise, the southern state was a cold house for the other traditions, and that to an extent enabled a mirror image to um, evolve in uh, Northern Ireland, enabled to some extent a historical sort of an anti-British sentiment and a kind of an identification of Irishness with uh, Catholicism. That's all loosening, of course, but um, some sort of acknowledgement of the past is uh, possibly of value. 
Under the cultural heading, then, I just want to raise the sort of delicate question of leadership. And leadership in this kind of context is available to every individual nationalist and every individual Republican, because you can challenge members of your own community if they're not being inclusive, if they're not being accommodating. Um, what I want to sort of suggest to you is really that every insensitive gesture, every disrespectful gesture towards the British identity, every tweet that could be construed as kind of insulting and putting down of the Protestant Unionist loyalist British identity actually takes us a step further away from a reconciled Ireland. So there is actually quite a, quite a degree of work that individual nationalists and Republicans can do to show leadership on that and challenge uh, people who make statements that are not accommodating. Other things that can be done is supporting, making the political institutions work, continuing to be involved in balanced and uh, inclusive commemorations. And then there's the whole sort of controversial issue of acknowledgements and apologies and so on. No, I mean, I don't want to get too deeply into that because I mean, it's very sensitive. I don't have any answers, but it's certainly a, a heading for further thought and discussion. And finally, then there's the question of the future and building inclusiveness into how you present the plans for your own vision of uh, Ireland constitutionally and politically going forward. And options here would be building accommodation very firmly into those plans, avoiding the triumphalism, uh, or maybe the 1921 to 72 period in reverse, guaranteeing equal rights, acknowledge the arguments for keeping the devolved institutions, keeping some of the links to Britain, the East West, be willing to discuss the sacred cows, the national symbols. Um, and then the question of kind of not threatening the unionist and British sort of cultural patrimony and inheritance to consider retaining all those existing symbols of unionist and British history, geography, memorials, culture, and so on. And rather than subtracting from them, add to them then and balance them with, with symbols from uh, Irish and nationalist history. Um, and finally, just to you know, leave you with a final sort of challenging thought is to continue react, uh, consider rather reactivating the membership of the Commonwealth on the logic that if it was good enough for Nelson Mandela, maybe it's good enough for Irish republicanism. And um, here's a second picture of a Tory minister uh, and Nelson Mandela shaking hands at a meeting of the Commonwealth Africa Investment Fund. Uh, Nelson Mandela attended quite a number of Commonwealth meetings, including two meetings of the um, summit of uh, heads of state and government. Um, the Commonwealth today is, is not the British Commonwealth that we left in 1949, we being the 26 counties. Um, it's, um, it is um, an equal international organization. Every country has the same vote, it's not dominated by Britain. And it's primarily an African and a Caribbean um, organization these days. So um, it would send a, a signal and a, it would be a symbol. And it would also be fantastic for Irish sports people. Uh, it might give them a chance to um, perform at the Commonwealth Games. I know it's, it's a bit provocative, but I think people have a lot of misconceptions about it. They think it involves acknowledging the Queen as the head of state. That's rubbish. It doesn't involve anything to do with the head of state. Um, She's the head of the organization, but that doesn't give her any constitutional role in the member countries. So with that sort of hopefully slightly provocative thought, um, I leave it at that. And um, if you want to do any further reading on, on this, my uh, latest book, Beyond the Border, is published by uh, Merion Press uh, for any further reading. So, Gramila Magwith. Mohi. Well, Gramila Magwith. Richard. Um, that was a very interesting and, and presentation and um, similar to your presentation last year. And I think it, um, it's timely and thought provoking uh, to say the least. Um, but what I would, would, would like, um, you, you, we, we'll, we'll maybe tease out in a bit more detail some of, the, uh, some of the points that you raised in your presentation there. And I think, I particularly think the title of your presentation today uh, is, is worthy of note, um, which is Unionist 
British identity identities accommodation now. Because very often in these conflicted situations, colonial situations that people find themselves in, accommodation comes at the end of the conflict in terms of a negotiated end to it. Whereas you're, you're arguing very clearly now for, for accommodation in terms of, of, of reconciliation. And so I was just wondering, um, why do you think national reconciliation in the context of accommodation now, um, what, why we've arrived at that point and why is it so important? Well, I go back to Gandhi and his famous quotation. It mightn't be verbatim, but I think it gets across the sense of, of what he meant when he said, you should be the change you want to see in the world. And it's easy to say that, of course, hard for people to live up to it, certainly hard for me to live up to it. But um, I think that's what applies here. Uh, nationalists and Republicans want to be accommodated. So the best way to be accommodated is to be accommodating. And um, you can't, I mean, the other saying that they have in psychology is you can't change the other person. You can only change yourself, and then that changes the dynamic. And I think that if the, I know there, there is a school of thought, and I don't totally dismiss it, that says, oh, well, you know, let's just keep things as they are. And then if the great and glorious day arrives when we get over the line of 50% plus one, uh, we'll then sort of sit down with unionists around the negotiating, around the negotiating table and see what they, what they want. Now, that's a school of thought. I don't totally dismiss it um, because I see, I see accommodation as an ongoing thing. It's not something you do once and then you solve the problem. Um, but I feel it's a, I feel it's a very it's a, it's a very narrow approach and it, it closes down all sorts of creative possibilities if you're not prepared to be accommodating until some future uh, some future undefined, a point of negotiations which might or might not ever happen because there's a number of possible unionist responses to the formation of a nationalist majority in the six counties. Um, they don't all include sitting around a negotiation table to negotiate their place in, in the United Ireland. Mm -hmm. So I go back to my point, you know, we have to live in the here and now. Let's try and improve the here and now, improve our relationships. Uh, and if you want to make a case for a unity uh, that case lacks quite a lot of credibility if if you're not prepared to if you're not prepared to do anything um, in the here and now um, for the other traditions. In the in the presentation, um, you listed you gave a long list of of, of gestures that have already been made mm. and are already on the record. Um, and I was just wondering, do they fit into this notion? of accommodating now? Or are they transient gestures, which are good for the time, but are not rooted in the notion of fundamental change in terms of accommodation now? Oh, no, I think those gestures are important. People can sort of dismiss or minimize gestures, but they're definitely part of it. Um, you know, some, maybe some of them are more gestural, some of them are more substantive. I mean, certainly a constitutional referendum is more than a gesture. It's quite a major uh, change and quite a major operation and a very difficult thing to do. Um, but I, I think what's good about what you're referring to as the gestures is they're kind of a collective reference point that everybody can understand. Everybody knows the power of a handshake between Queen Elizabeth and Martin McGuinness. You know, you don't need to know a whole lot of Irish history uh, to know that that's a very important step and a form of sort of cultural Rubicon being crossed. Now, there's an awful lot of cultural Rubicons we need to cross. Um, this is why I'm talking about accommodation being a kind of a conversation. It's a process. It's not something that happens once for all time. Uh, there's going to be a very long road between now and any potential border poll, and even after that, even assuming for the sake of argument, the hypothesis that the border poll results in a majority for Irish unity, there's then going to be quite a further lengthy period 
in which reconciliation and accommodation are going to have to be on the agenda, probably for a very long time. So, um, so no, the, these gestures are crucial, they're vital and they're important. And, uh, but as long as we don't sort of feel we've kind of done that, and that that's kind of boxed off, that it's a start for a conversation. But and how do you be... feel, how would you react to comments that these gestures that were made um, were basically banked by people on the unionist side and there was no reciprocity? There was nothing coming back from either the unionist parties or from within the broad unionist community. Sure. And, you, and you made the point in your presentation that you thought that that was a conversation for another day. Yeah. But in the here and now and, and, and in the mood that, that, that is very often out there in, 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 in the broad nationalist and unionist community, reciprocity uh, can be seen as a very important um, mood changer in terms of, of, of investment in, in accommodating unionists, if you like. You know, people look to it and say, well, what are nationalists getting out of it, if you like, to use that type of language? So what's your view about a twin track approach or a parallel approach in terms of, of, of accommodation now on both sides? Um, okay, well, I think, I think you've raised a lot of very interesting questions there. Um, I think, I mean, my general feeling is nationalism and republicanism doesn't need any, any encouragement, certainly doesn't need any encouragement from me to make its case and state its grievances and demand and so on. I mean, there's a, you know, there's an awful lot of activity going on about what um, the nationalist Republican demands are and has been, well, particularly since Brexit uh, appeared on the agenda. Um, so I suppose I'm, I'm, you know, I'd, I'd like to kind of challenge Republicanism to also kind of beef up the other aspect of so much not what unionists can do for you, but what you can do for unionists. I go back to my point, you're not really doing it. It's not totally instrumental. There's no point doing it just to get something back. Uh, you can't change the other person. And you know, there are unionists who you will never change and segments of unionism that will never um, change their views. Look, on the other hand, though, there are quid pro quos, and that's in the realm of political negotiation and discussion. I mean, the various... Um, Agreements that have happened, uh, the latest agreement, uh, nationalism slash republicanism is getting something and it's giving something and everyone moves on and the executive is is reformed. Um, so there is something coming through. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's all one way traffic. Um, but the other thing is, you know, there are so many shades of unionism and so many shades of identity and all that is loosening. Brexit certainly has, has helped loosen it. Um, so you have a fairly large and growing category of inverted commas others, and you have a kind of a large enough category of what you might call soft unionism with individuals getting involved in debate and discussion around these kind of issues. So, um, you know, should, unilateral gestures and self-examination and self-criticism, if you like, on the Republican side of the House has a huge appeal for that as end of the discussion. I was interested in um, I was interested in, 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 in your observations around what you call shades of identity in, in, in your presentation, where you talked about the Irish and British dimensions in a way interplaying in a human sense mm. between the two between the two islands. And I was just wondering about um, about the role, the common, the outside of the conflicted history, if you like, if you wanted to step outside of that and, and, and this common history that there is between the two islands because of their proximity, because of their history. Yeah. And this exploration of the Irish dimension to one's life and the, the British dimension to, 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 to the Irish. Uh, what, what, what's your sense of, of where that's sitting in the broad uh, discourse? Are people aware of it? Do, do, are they, or do they just go about their normal lives in terms of, of, of an impact on, the, on how they think and see themselves? I think that... I think that the further we get 
in terms of time from the end of the troubles, the looser these kind of identity questions are going to become. Um, in other words, the less conflictual people's sort of lived experience has been, um, maybe the less kind of politicized these sort of questions become. I mean, you can, we, you know, I'm, I like to talk about Ar Ireland's British dimension, but there's also Britain's Irish dimension. There's an awful lot of Irish people in England, many of whom see themselves as British now. Uh, on the other hand, many of whom see themselves as Irish right down to the second or third generation, um, even though they've been in Britain for a very long time. So um, I, think, I think there is fluidity um, and I think that's increasing. But on the other hand, there, there also is a kind of a certain reservoir of anti-Britishness. Um, I certainly see it in the 26 counties. Um, it's the sort of at the level where people kind of instinctively cheer for whoever is playing against the English football team, for example. Um, now, even as time, I mean, I, you know, I regard that as kind of very... Um, yeah, a very unhappy sort of a gut reaction. I mean, I know, you know, I can understand it with Ireland, Ireland's history and so forth, but we've got to get over that. You know, we've got to ask ourselves questions. Is this really the most mature way to kind of deal with the whole question of Britishness? Um, I think recent years and recent football competitions, actually, that has loosened up a bit. I mean, I know there was a stage when um, there were reversible football shirts being sold with Ireland on one side and and England or the other. Um, uh, and the English women's um, football team success has also been a kind of a help because that's, um, that's also been much less <laughs> threatening maybe to people's sense of identity and they have been pre prepared to uh, follow the English uh, women's team and cheer them on um, uh, without feeling they're compromising their Irishness. So look, it's all very gradual and very glacial um, there is a lot of anti-Britishness um, even within the 26 counties. So I just, look, all I'm trying to do is just name it, um, say it's there, uh, challenge it, um, and say, look, can we not uh, sort of grow up a bit, um, have a more mature attitude, realise we are partly, uh, even if it's only 1%, <laughs> partly British um, in terms of culture, history, geography, architecture, um, the national institutions, uh, the setup of the civil service, the courts, uh, the parliamentary system, the whole shooting gallery. We have inherited a lot of things and made positive use of them um, from the British. Um, it's a kind of like, what have the Romans ever done for us type of thing. So look, um, that's the best I can, I can say to you. I know, it's, I know it's very sensitive and delicate and I know a lot of people will be saying, no, sorry, what are you talking about? I, I have no British identity, I'm 100% Irish. Um, but nobody's 100% anything. Um, I might have mentioned last year that uh, we did uh, DNA analysis. All of my Humphreys ancestors were all peasant farmers in Limerick going back hundreds of years. But strangely enough, there is about 10, 15% English DNA in there somewhere. So it just shows even for Irish peasant yeah. farmers, uh, <laughs> there is some English dimension creeping in there. And we're just at the very, in the early days of, of, of the new Irish government and Taoiseach Micheál Martin, leader of Fianna Fáil, um, is now, is now leading, leading the Irish government. And I'd just like you to talk about the role the Irish government has to play in terms of this area of, of accommodation now. And specifically, the, how, how could that be, be reflected in the, in the, in the, in the shared island unit that's in the Taoiseach's office. Sure. Well, look, I want to tread carefully there because, you know, separation of powers and so on. It's a matter of political judgment as to exactly what they want to do. All I'm really saying is, look, the, the previous forum for peace and uh, reconciliation fizzled out on this very question. They were working on a draft report. Um, the Downing Street Declaration says specifically that the Irish state would look at any aspects of uh, Irish life that could be represented as being um, not inclusive and not accommodating in terms of the British and Unionist identity. Um, the forum looked at that, but they couldn't agree on a report. Uh, the reason being that um, 
uh, the view at the time was that, well, these are things we can talk about when the union has come around the negotiating table. So that actually was the buffer that it ran up against and nothing was produced under that heading. So, you know, if, you know, if it were to be decided to look at this issue in the context of the shared island unit, one option, which, you know, I'm just suggesting for consideration is um, to take up where the forum left off and have a forum on reconciliation and accommodation and look at some of these issues. I think one of the what, one of the ways that the forum, you know, could in terms of its its, its remit, because you also mentioned this uh, in, in in the presentation about anthems, flags, symbols, and of course you, the, the Commonwealth as well. That there there, there would need there needs to be some sort of um, place where people can go with their ideas, to put their ideas forward about possible changes, because these are these sort of issues here. Are, are, are very are, are very sensitive and very emotional, but yet if, if if the Irish government was to lead in this field, it might make it easier for people to travel down that particular road when it comes to issues like the flag, yeah, you know, um, yeah. anthems, sure, the Commonwealth. This is this is where this issue of accommodation now yeah. becomes really. Uh, you know, uh, 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 in, in troubled area or sensitive area. Yeah. And, and so maybe if it was taken out of the immediacy of the North and put somewhere like uh, a, a forum for, for, for reconciliation, what, yeah. what, what, what's your sense of how to handle these quite powerfully emotive issues mm. in a practical way? No, I totally get your point that where do you talk about them? Um, and, uh, you know, I'm grateful to Fela for yet again giving me the chance to raise some of these issues here with this audience, which is a very important part of the conversation. And the, um, you yeah, know, there are a number of other bodies, if we can say, in the, in the civil society sector that are talking about these issues. Um, but there isn't any kind of an official kind of forum. I mean, you know, I take that point. Um, I mean, obviously, nationalism and republicanism, if they feel the Irish government isn't getting involved, you know, have the option of setting up some sort of a committee or forum mm -hmm. themselves. Now, that goes well beyond any one political party. Um, but, you know, you're not, you're not totally dependent on the Irish state to um, have a discussion, uh, obviously. Um, so that's an option. Also, you're perfectly able to make proposals to the Irish government and say, look, this is what it could look like and there are different strands and so forth. Now, you know, maybe on a broader question, I do understand the idea that um, Republicans in particular is anxious to sort of move things along to a border poll. Um, um, my own view, uh, you can call it my two cents if you want to. <laughs> I'm certainly not saying the Irish nationalist aspiration has to wait. Um, the Good Friday Agreement is very clear. Nationalists are entitled to be nationalists. Um, but um, there is a certain amount of groundwork you have to do before that's a meaningful proposition. And probably item number one in terms of the groundwork is making some serious headway on the whole question of uh, accommodation and if you like putting down a deposit on that subject and no point just promising it down the line mm -hmm. um let's see the color of your money essentially up front well i think this i think that's the power behind the concept that you're arguing in terms of accommodation now that you really want to see the change in place uh now and tell me in your own as a broad assessment of the mood of, of the unionist community when they look down the road in relation to Ireland's future and the possibility of independence or, or, or whatever the case might be. Yeah. Do you think a planned approach to accommodate now their identity and their cultural aspirations, their Britishness, their unionist, uh, unionist uh, identity and their, 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 their historical place on the island, do you think accommodation now would make it easier for them to come to terms with a new Ireland that, 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 that's independent? Well, what about its structures? Okay, well look, just to be clear, I'm not, I'm not, arguing, I'm not arguing for accommodation so that you can persuade unionists to back a nice Ireland, okay? I'm arguing it as something we're doing in its own right. Now, as it happens, I think it shows that your case for a nice Ireland is one made in good faith 
So it, you know, for those who want to achieve that objective, it has that benefit. Uh, look, I think, I think the, um, I mean, the way that the Good Friday Agreement is set up essentially is that the unionism bet the farm on keeping ahead on 50% plus one permanently. And um, there certainly is evidence that that might not have been a totally solid bet, if I can put it like that. But the level of reaction, I mean, unionism historically obviously has been in a sense frozen to a large extent by its kind of defensive posture. Uh, we have um, what we want. Uh, we want a kind of a permanent settlement and we want to keep that. And a, ma a major strand of unionism is very much opposed to the notion of kind of ongoing negotiation, ongoing discussion, their state being kind of provisional and um, having a possible sort of end point and extinction. Um, so, you know, you'll be waiting a long time for any, for, for that segment of unionism to take the initiative on anything. But, I mean, the way I see it is, look, there's some people you're never going to um, have any impact on in terms of their views. Um, that's fine. That's perfectly okay. <laughs> but why not um, at least try and see what you can do in terms of the people who um, are prepared to talk to you about possible um, future options? I mean, um, you know, my own view is the if Irish unity is ever put to the people, it needs to be the most accommodating kind of version uh, possible. Uh, you know, I personally would have no problem with the idea of nationalism sort of offering a very lengthy kind of period of joint authority or something similar to that as a transitional measure, not as a permanent measure, obviously. Um, but that, in other words, the transfer to Irish sovereignty wouldn't happen overnight. It would happen over a period of time and it would be seen to be kind of non-threatening. Um, you know, you have the Arlene Foster view that if there was a vote for Irish unity, she'd probably leave Northern Ireland. I mean, I think that's sad and it's a shame. Um, and I certainly hope she doesn't, but um, if, if it ever does happen. But um, I think I think for people who feel like that, um, there is there is definitely a value in saying, look, your rights are secure and your property secure and your culture and your memorials and your history and your geography and your links with Britain, your, your British citizenship, um, uh, your affinity to the Queen, um, you know, all of the kind of cultural things that make you British are all going to be secure and protected and not just sort of acknowledged, but even kind of celebrated to an extent um, within the kind of um, in Irish context. And, you know, that can start now. There's no reason to, to it devalues it, I think, to say, look, we'll, we'll try and do something for you someday, but we're not going to do anything for you right now. Well, what, what I would say to you maybe on this concluding, concluding comment now is that um, your contribution thus far at last year's fill and today's uh, con contribution is actually fitting in very neatly to a wider conversation that there is, uh, particularly in Northern society, maybe less so than in the South, but certainly in the North, there's a widespread conversation going on with people from a unionist and Protestant background sure. who are opening up their minds and our minds yeah. by what they're saying uh, on the question of Ireland's future. And it strikes me that the accommodation now argument that you're pioneering and, and advocating and, and demonstrating, I think, uh, the benefits of it, I think will make a valuable contribution to the debate about Ireland's future. And I'd like to thank you um, on behalf of Phelan Fubble for being here this year with us in the most difficult of circumstances. And we appreciate that. Thanks, Gurmila Mayavad. Gurmila Mayavad, Jim. Pleasure to be here and thank you very much. Mm -hmm.